There's mounting concern in Washington over the planned prosecution of dozens of pro-democracy activists in Egypt, including 19 Americans. Egyptian officials say it's a matter of law. The non-governmental organizations broke it by receiving foreign funding without government approval. Is that the whole story, or is there a political motive behind it all? This is Inside Story. Hello again and welcome to Inside Story. I'm James Bays. Relations between Egypt's military rulers and the US government had hit a distinctly rocky patch. 19 Americans are among 43 workers from NGOs or non-governmental organisations who've been sent for trial in the Cairo Criminal Court over charges of illegally using foreign funds to encourage unrest in the country. Putting the issue firmly in the US media spotlight, the son of the US Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood, is among the Americans who it's believed will have to face charges. Sam LaHood heads the Egyptian office of the International Republican Institute and was among several foreign workers banned from leaving Egypt just over a week ago after their offices were raided by armed police. The move prompted harsh criticism and even threats from Washington to review the US aid to Cairo. The announcement came on a fourth day of violent street protests in Egypt amid anger at the authorities' perceived inability to prevent a riot at a football match last week that left 74 people dead. Some observers believe the country's military rulers are trying to blame recent unrest and violence on a foreign conspiracy. So does the Egyptian military junta genuinely believe that NGOs are destabilizing Egypt or are they looking for a scapegoat to take responsibility for the current instability? To answer the question, we're joined by our panel of guests, all of them in the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Professor Maged Reda Boutras, head of the political science department at Helwan University. Sarah Topol, an American journalist based in Cairo who blogs for the New York Times. And Soher Riyad, a human rights specialist at the Cairo Institute for Human Rights studies. Welcome to you all. And can I ask you first, uh, Soher, um, about uh, these charges. We understand that your organisation may well be on the list and some of your colleagues may well be about to char be charged because we haven't had the formal charges out yet. What's your reaction? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Uh, no one knows anything for sure. No one knows anything uh, complete. What we have been hearing since last June is basically press leaks in state-owned newspapers uh, accusing NGOs, accusing human rights uh, groups in particular uh, of uh, all the accusations you can think of, from uh, illegally receiving foreign funds uh, to high treason. And uh, in some cases, last December, the Minister of Justice even accused NGOs in general uh, of orchestrating uh, the the violent events uh, in Mespiro and in the cabinet and in Mohammed Mahmoud Street. Okay, so far, but but uh, but, our but, but so, so here, if this is true, if these leaks are true, what is going to be the reaction from your organisation? Well, the reaction would be uh, like all the other organisations that have been actually uh, 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 that have appeared in front of the investigating judges. Uh, we will, uh, we will, of course, go. We will, uh, we will, uh, we will speak. We will be, uh, we will be questioned. Uh, but this is not, this is not at all the problem. The problem here is not a, a certain entity that is illegally uh, doing something and they want uh, to, to, to legalize whatever is going on. Uh, the, the, the question is more political. And this the question is uh, of how to silence all the voices that are currently speaking out against the violations that is being committed by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces throughout the last year uh, it's not it's not legal at all and we should not go through this path because um, everyone knows that uh, Starting with the smear campaign last June and ending with the raiding of uh, uh, of democracy groups and NGOs uh, on the 29th of December 2011, and going through with actually uh, presenting criminal charges to 40 human rights defenders uh, and workers at these NGOs, everyone knows that this is this has more to do than just a legal uh, 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 procedure. Okay, it has everything let to do me with put all those political connotations. Let too. me put those points to Maged. The claim there that it is politically motivated. Your view on that? Well, the rule of law should prevail in any country. No one organization that's working in the international arena should work in any country without uh, a prior permit. 
Now, there are allegations that uh, th those uh, uh, raids are politically motivated. Now, if it's politically motivated, now why the judiciary is taking a part in it? Now, this is this falls, those felonies fall uh, under the auspices and articles of the law. Now, we have two dimensions. The permit to start with, to start the organization, and another permit to receive foreign funds. Now, uh, if you are uh, uh, charged of the two violations, that's a big problem. Now, the SCAF is faced with a very critical uh, moments in Egypt. Now, the this scarf, is, let, uh, let's just be clear to our to our viewers. SCAF is the is the abbreviation for the military rulers of Egypt, the military command. Yes. Yeah. No, it's the Supreme uh, Military uh, uh, Supreme organization Council for the Armed in Forces. Egypt. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, exactly. So this uh, SCAF is trying to um, hold things together against uh, a chaotic situation. Now, uh, in the initial uh, judiciary reports uh, stated that many people admitted they received funds from NGOs that uh, were funded from abroad. Now, so the government, uh, the, the, I mean the government or the ruling uh, council wants to make sure that all those organizations are regulated uh, uh, and uh, abiding to the laws and the regulations in Egypt. So okay, Maggot. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to prevail. Okay, I'd like to bring in Sarah. She is the American on our panel, an American journalist in Cairo. You've heard the professor's argument there. He even brought in pyramids when uh, discussing Egypt. But of course, the key factor in this is among those supposedly on this list are 19 Americans. How serious do you think this is going to be with regard to uh, Egyptian US relations, Sarah? Um, I think the situation is very serious. I think Washington, D.C. is taking it very seriously. As a matter of fact, it seems the situation continues to escalate. The United States has released numerous statements, um, and high-level officials have made phone calls to the ruling generals, including President Obama and Defense Secretary Panetta. Uh, Hillary Clinton spoke to the foreign minister this weekend to express dismay. Uh, at what was happening. I think it's uh, it's being taken very seriously in Washington, D.C. Um, I don't think we've seen something like this before. OK. Well, Sohair, I'd like to examine, before we look at all the uh, implications of this, exactly what is the situation right now? Because it is rather confused. As you were telling us before, it's all based on press leaks. Those press leaks say that there are going to be 19 Americans, 14 Egyptians, five Serbs, two Germans and three from other Arab countries who are going to be prosecuted. Uh, do you believe that information? Uh, yes, there is no reason why uh, we should not believe this. Uh, as, uh, as Sarah was mentioning, um, the situation is going from bad to worse. Uh, after the raids, and even prior to the raids on NGOs on December 29th, you had uh, uh, certain uh, uh, NGOs being, certain uh, um, human rights defenders and activists from certain NGOs being summoned to appear before prosecution, to appear before the two investigating judges that have been appointed on this case. Um, after the raids uh, and the confiscation of uh, documents and computers, uh, you had um, at least seven uh, uh, organizations where numerous, even dozens, of, of its workers appeared before uh, prosecution. It, it, it appears as if they were actually trying to formulate some sort of a case to take it to the criminal uh, court. You talk so, there about um, the raids. So having... You talk there about the raids. Yes, Let me bring in sorry. Sarah on that. I know you went to one of these organizations immediately after the raid had taken place. Paint us a picture of, of what the offices look like. Um, well, the office is uh, it's a house. I went to the offices of the National Democratic Institute and I spoke to the country director, Julie Hughes. The office was, um, they removed computers, telephone equipment, uh, they took cash from their safe. Uh, they corralled the staff into their training room, which is like their conference room. And uh, they were there for over six hours as everybody packed up, as, uh, as she said, over a dozen 
um, police officers, including uh, about six with AK-47s charged into the office and uh, took, took all of their belongings and they're currently working on their personal computers and she even told me they asked them for boxes at the end of the raid in order to cart the NDI's belongings away. Maged, it sounds like a pretty intimidating moment when these, these groups had their offices raided. Do you approve of the way it was done? Uh, let me first uh, talk about uh, specific issues. First issue is that we are talking about a sovereign state. Now, any country that uh, allows uh, an institution to work without a permit, though they, they, some, some of those organizations allege that they uh, applied for a permit and they didn't get it. So does this mean that they start operation, uh, operating, I mean, in a country uh, and start their operations without this permit? Of course, well, hang no on. Th country, these, no organiz these organizations, these organizations, Maggot, have been applying for permits for years, and they've been existing, doing their work for years. They've almost been tolerated, even by the Mubarak government, for years, and then suddenly there's crackdown. If this happens in this regime, I'm the first one to state that. Uh, this is a, a problem with the regime, but now I'm talking about st uh, 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 status quo. The status quo uh, or the ipso facto. <coughs> now, no country would allow uh, an organization without a permit. Let's talk about this situation. No country would allow it. Now, United States, you mentioned something about United States and the dismay. Uh, now, uh, United States uh, works in its diplomatic relation according to one key factor, which is the national interest. Now, the uh, United States always calls uh, uh, permanently call, calling for the rule of law. Now, when you implement the law, though in the, in the previous regime they allege that the, the, the law is not implemented, then do we imp when we implement the law, now, United States would complain. Okay. Now, this is a question. Okay, let me, let me get Soher's view on some of the things that you've said. Soher, why did your organization not have a permit? Well, we do. But uh, I think Dr. Megid's point is very important, and we need to make something very, very clear. Now, no one is against uh, uh, Egypt's sovereignty. No one is against uh, uh, even transparency. Uh, in fact, NGOs have been calling for transparency in the law uh, 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 since, since actually this whole debate started, not now, but years and years ago. Now, the problem with the current law, which is law 84 for 2002, the current association law, is that it grants um, extreme, uh, and, I, and when I say extreme, this is even a very, very limited word to explain this, extreme uh, uh, authority to the Ministry of Social Solidarity. Uh, it has the right to even dissolve the board members of the NGOs. It has, uh, it has the right to, uh, to, 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 agree, to, to agree to the permit of the NGO, but rather not to agree. And so you have uh, dozens of NGOs that are currently actually have been trying repeatedly for the past years to, to take this permit from, uh, from the Ministry of Social Solidarity, but the ministry usually not, doesn't even refuse, but does not come back with a, with a, with a response. And this has been uh, the status, for example, of the International Public Institute and the National Democratic Institute, who have been working uh, very closely with the Ministry of External Affairs, by the way, until they were raided. Okay. And now, so, so here, let, let, let us delve yes. a little bit further into the background of this. Now, Egypt's military ruling council has vowed to investigate how pro-democracy and human rights organizations are funded, and it's repeatedly, repeatedly said it will not tolerate foreign interference in the country's affairs. The funding issue concerning these groups, non-governmental organizations or NGOs, has been a controversial issue for months. In July, the government of the former prime minister, SM Sharaf, drew up a fact-finding committee headed by the Justice Minister to investigate charges of foreign funding for unlicensed local and international NGOs. The committee sought to blacklist NGOs found to have requested financial assistance from the US government's own foreign aid department, USAID. In September, the cabinet said the government investigation found about 30 NGOs to have been illegally receiving foreign funding because they were not registered. 
And in October, Egypt's justice minister announced that he'd commissioned two judges to investigate foreign funding allegations. At the same time, the minister said any organisation found guilty of the practice would be charged with, and I quote, betraying Egypt by deliberately promoting political strife. Magid, tell me, what is the possible punishment if people are found guilty? Uh, I learned from when I was young not to comment on the sentences by the uh, judges. The judiciary uh, authority, by law, when they uh, abide by law, if they vindicate those organizations, I'm the first one to say uh, 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 th th that's, that's satisfying for me. Okay, if you don't want to comment uh, on possible sentences. You don't want to comment on possible sentences. But give our viewers a clue. Of course. Could these offences, if people are formally charged, could they lead to jail? Of course. Why not? I mean, we are all uh, under the uh, uh, rule of law. Uh, anybody, even the ex-president, now he is in jail. He is uh, uh, in jail for uh, uh, alleged uh, uh, felonies. So uh, uh, everybody should be under the rule of law. Sarah, Sarah this, the, the fact that they could face jail, uh, some of these people who are believed to be on the list must be very concerned about their situation. I understand some, it's believed to have taken asylum uh, in the US embassy compound. Is that your understanding? That's correct. Uh, three, as far as we've heard, three uh, American staffers have sought refuge in the U.S. Embassy compound because of fear of harassment um, and possible trial. I think that the media reports say that these people could face five years in jail as well as a financial fine. Sohair, can I ask you whether you think that the police and the prosecutors have been doing this uh, with an even hand because there have been some suggestions that some Islamist NGOs have been completely untouched by this. Well, we have to we have to say something here. You you mentioned the uh, uh, the commission of inquiry or the investigating commission that was uh, created by the Ministry of Justice in uh, 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 a couple of months ago. Uh, they have also appointed two investigating judges. The investigating judges uh, who are working on it is Judge Ashraf Al Hashmiri uh, uh, and Judge uh, uh, Samah Abu Zaid. They are uh, they have previously worked as prosecutors for the <coughs> High State Security uh, uh, Court or prosecution, I mean, uh, they were for example, responsible for a lot of political cases, amongst which is Ayman Noor. And so speaking about uh, speaking about this process being uh, uh, fair or being at least uh, uh, not politicized or being extremely legal is something that uh, now is not, it's not, uh, it's, I would not understand someone speaking about this situation being extremely legal. We are NGOs that are actually working on uh, the promotion of the respect of the rule of law. And so uh, as NGOs, We've even asked, we've even proposed uh, a draft NGO law that would um, that would that 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 is at least that at least abides by international human rights standards. And we have proposed this numerously uh, for the Mubarak government and now for the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. The main problem here is not with, with, with organizations not being registered under the association law uh, or being registered as uh, civil companies. Uh, the main problem here is that this campaign, since its beginning, has included names of NGOs that almost all independent human rights organizations have been included in a press leak or two, uh, have been accused of, uh, of hurting national morale or of, uh, of high treason or of... Um, inciting uh, protesters or inciting to hatred or inciting against the military council or whatever accusations you want you, you want to include. Okay, so now, her, these what are I'd like to examine, that are being targeted. Th so her, Not, so just like to stop you there because yes. we, we don't have so much time and I would like to examine how this is going to affect US Egyptian relations. On Saturday, a day before Egypt's decision to send 43 people to trials, the US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton warned her Egyptian counterpart the dispute may lead to the loss of much of the US 
annual aid to Cairo. So what sort of financial help does Egypt get from the US? Let's have a closer look. Most of the American aid goes to the US military. That's according to the US Congressional Research Service report. Let's look at the breakdown. Over the last 30 years, Egypt's been the second largest recipient of US foreign aid after Israel in 2010 and 2011, one3 billion dollars went to strengthen Egyptian forces. The bulk of the military assistance goes to pay for Egypt's purchases of military hardware, upgrades to existing equipment and maintenance and support contract. Another 1.9 million dollars went to training meant to bolster long-term US-Egyptian military cooperation. It's also worth mentioning that the US grants Egypt about 250 million dollars in economic assistance that's divided among several sectors including health, education, economic development and and the promotion of democracy. Maged, are you concerned that all of this money going to the generals who ultimately run your country and ultimately have control of what happens there may well be cut? It happens to be that my PhD dissertation was on the US-Egyptian relationship. Now, so I can uh, say something about it. Uh, now, You're the, the key expert. Word here Go ahead. Is <laughs> It's, uh, if we look at the US-Egypt uh, relationships, uh, we have to look at the magic word, the, the national interest. Now, why did the United States uh, 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 funded Egypt uh, all those years since 1978 till now? Uh, uh, it was under the auspices and one of the terms of the uh, peace treaty in 1978 so it's a payment of a reward uh, for took, Camp David, and it's still going on 30 years later. Ex exactly. So uh, Israel is getting much more than what Egypt gets. That's part of the terms of the U.S.-Egypt uh, relationship. So you don't think and it'll be cut? Treaty. You don't think there's a possibility now it'll be cut? We have to distinguish between the military aid, which is $1.3 billion a year annually, and uh, about $250 million of economic aid. Now, Egypt uh, asked the United States for, for four or five years ago to uh, replace this aid with partnership, economic partnership, because Egypt, uh, now uh, please quote me for this word, was sick of the conditions and terms imposed by the US. Uh, and repeatedly they asked to uh, uh, replace it, and there were ongoing neg negotiations about this issue. Okay, about well, I just want to stop you there, Maggie. Let's get Sarah's perspective because she is our American guest. What do you think, given the current circumstances and the mood on Capitol Hill? Could this money be cut? It seems as if the continued escalation of the raid leaves the Americans no choice. Uh, as people I've spoken to in Washington have said, there's absolutely no way that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton could certify genuinely that Egypt is abiding by the stipulations set out by the conditionality of aid. Uh, there's the, the continued uh, crackdown on civil society here makes it somewhat impossible uh, to do anything except use the national security waiver that Clinton is allowed to use to let the aid go through, but that seems like it would cause an intense backlash on Capitol Hill, especially since last week 41 uh, lawmakers sent a letter to both Clinton and Tentawi saying that they that there's no way that they would let this go without a big fight. Okay, so here I don't understand this. Why would the generals do this then, given that they get the biggest slice of this money? What's their motivation? With a country that no one really knows how things are getting managed, no, uh, no, no rule of law that applies, you can never know the answer to that question. You never know why is this happening. You can also assume that in, in some sort of a balance between uh, letting independent human rights organizations work on the ground or having, uh, uh, or having cutting relations with the Americans, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the first one out. You never know. But it's very important also to mention that not only the American NGOs and the international NGOs that are at stake now, the fate of almost all independent Egyptian human rights organizations is also at stake. 
You have certain Egyptian organizations that are also undergoing investigations. You have at least nine, uh, according to press leaks, uh, Egyptians that are also going to face uh, uh, criminal charges. And, you, and the list goes on and on. And you have almost over 40 other human rights organizations and defenders that, ha that their names have been included in press leaks since last June. Okay, and so when, it, when, wor you. when worse comes to worse, it thank could you. be a crackdown to, to We have to end it there. Thank, thank you. you as ever to our panel of guests in the Egyptian capital for this program. They were Soher Riyad, Sarah Topel, and Professor Magid Reda Boutros. Thanks to each of you for your time, and thanks to you too for spending the last half hour with us. Your thoughts about this program and your ideas about future editions of Inside Story to us by email, please, inside story at aljazeera.net. And make sure you're back here with me 24 hours from now. Bye bye.